And, um, and let's turn over in our Bibles to Daniel chapter 4. And you can do so in a pew Bible, or you can um, take out your phone. And if you have the Bible app on your phone, um, you, can, uh, you can search that. Daniel chapter 4 is where we're going. And we've been in a message series that we have entitled, Stand Up, Dare to Stand in a Bowed Down world. And uh, as you turn to the scripture, can I just tell you about a little bit about the creator of the Bible app that you may have on your phone? Um, it is, I think, the top downloaded app that uh, has ever existed in the history of smartphones. And if, uh, if you have that app, it is put out by a church called Life Church. If you ever have an opportunity to listen to some of their worship music or listen to their pastor, Craig Grishel, um, he has done a lot in the ministry of the Word of God. And uh, their mission is to eliminate Bible poverty globally. And so uh, they have a plan to, um, to translate the scriptures so that, that every nation and language and tongue have access to the Word of God. And, uh, and so, so what a blessing, but um, as I was doing some studying this week, my life and uh, studying intersected with one of the messages that Craig Rochelle gave on Daniel chapter 4. And uh, as, he was, as he was doing some study and, and preparing his message, what he said is that he, he did some study on dreams. And if you know the book of Daniel, what you'll see is that there's actually a number of dreams that King Nebuchadnezzar has. In chapter 2, which we didn't get to talk about, but you probably read, uh, if you've been following our reading plan, you read about a dream Nebuchadnezzar had, and he wouldn't tell it to anyone. He expected his, his enchanters and magicians to be able to tell him his dream and then interpret it. And then, then Daniel came in, and um, he sought the Lord. God gave him the dream and its interpretation, and he brought it before Nebuchadnezzar. And here then in chapter 4, we see this happen again, except this time King Nebuchadnezzar tells the dream to his magicians and his enchanters. And we're going to see this story. But as, as, we, as we get into the text this morning, what I want to talk to you guys about is, is about dreams for a moment. Because uh, dreams are something that I think we all have um, it, it may be different seasons of your life where you felt like you've had more dreams or less dreams. Lately, myself, I haven't dreamt very much at all. But I, I, this morning, my son Jesse said, I had a dream this, you know, last night. And it's something that actually dreams are, are something that, that come from different places in our life, and they, they actually mean different things. Um, a few articles that uh, Craig Rochelle um, studied I showed that, that dreams symbolize different things. I want to tell you about them for a second. How many of you have ever had a dream that you were falling? Yeah, okay, this is most of us, okay? Now, it may happen right when you fall asleep. You have this like little flinch that's like, Ooh, and it's like, and you're like, oh, okay. And then you wake up for a second and you fall asleep. Or maybe you're sleeping beside someone and you're like, oh man, they, they just like, they just like, you know, jolted for a second. That happens, but there's also dreams where you like feel like you're falling off of your bed. You may actually fall off your bed, or, or it's just a dream like you felt like you were like falling, and, you know. Those things happen. Well, I'll tell you what this means. This could mean that there is something in your life that you cannot control, or something that is really concerning you. And so you just feel out of control, okay? That, that kind of makes sense. How many of you have ever dreamt that you were late for work? Late for work, yes, I have done that too. Um, maybe uh, if you're a student, you forgot to go to class. I had a dream one time that I forgot to go to a whole class the whole semester, okay? And I completely failed, failed the semester of that class. Thankfully, I woke up. It wasn't a dream, okay? I'll tell you what this could mean. It could mean that you don't feel adequately prepared for something, okay? I'll tell you what, um, some of you also have dreams where you show up to somewhere and you're not wearing what you should be wearing, right? You know what I'm talking about, okay? Maybe you showed up with no pants on at all, okay? That could mean the same thing, okay? So if you had that dream, maybe you feel like, I'm not prepared. I'm not prepared for what, what's coming up ahead, okay? Okay. How about this one? 
any of you ever get a dream that you are stuck, like your feet weigh like a thousand pounds and you're like, oh, you're slogging through mud or your, your arms, arms just, you can't lift up your arms. Anyone, anyone have a dream like that? Yeah, this is what this could mean. Um, it could mean that you are feeling overwhelmed, okay? How many of you have ever dreamt about dirty water? Dirty water, anybody? This isn't a common one, but I'll tell you what it means. It doesn't mean you live in Peyton City, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but it could mean, this could mean if you dream about dirty water, your body could be telling you that you are sick or you have some kind of disease. So if you have that dream, this is your body telling you maybe you should go see a doctor, okay? Um, how about this one? Any, any of you ever dream that you had to go to the bathroom? Okay, I'll tell you what, that is not a dream. <laughs> it means you need to get up and you need to go to the bathroom, okay? And if you've ever dreamt that you went to the bathroom, that is also not a dream. <laughs> Trust me, I know. So dreams are interesting. Dreams are very interesting. And back in the time of Daniel, when we go to Daniel chapter 4, we see that Nebuchadnezzar took dreams very seriously. And um, they, uh, they put so much importance on dreams and their interpretation that uh, they said that leaving a dream uninterpreted is like leaving a letter unread. Think about that. In chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar, he has a dream. Here's his dream. Um, Daniel chapter 4, we'll start at verse 4. And um, I'm going to try to give you the gist of this whole text as we go. We, we're not going to be able to read every single verse, but we'll, we'll read most of it. Verse 4, starting verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. And I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in my bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians and the enchanters and the Chaldeans and the astrologers came in, and I told them the dream, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. Now, in reality, what I think was happening as he brought these people in, all his wise, wise men, these magicians, enchanters, and astrologers, is that it wasn't that they could not interpret the dream. I think it's that they would not interpret the dream. Because as we'll see, this was not a positive message. And kings back then, dictators back then, were famous for killing the messenger of bad news. Anyone ever, ever used the phrase, don't shoot the messenger? Yes. yes, okay. Any of you had a job where you just had to deliver bad news all the time? Yeah, okay. I worked in, a, in, a, in an athletic building when I was in college. And uh, one of my jobs as the desk worker was to make sure that everyone that came in to work out at the gym, especially if they, they were using the basketball courts or the, or the racquetball courts, was that they came in with a second pair of shoes, not street shoes, okay? And so oftentimes, as the, the walk to the athletic building was, was quite the hike from the dorm rooms that were, you know, just, a, you know, another block away. And so we'd see students come in. We were always checking, do you have a second pair of shoes? Do you have a second pair of shoes? And if somebody didn't have a second pair of shoes, we said, go back to your dorm. You got to get them. And man, people got so upset. And I'll be honest, I did it. I've done it before too. And it was really frustrating. But man, we'd always use that phrase like, sorry, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just here to enforce the rules. And uh, this is the kind of mentality that, that I think these magicians and enchanters and astrologers had is they did not want to be the messengers of bad news for King Nebuchadnezzar. Because as you'll see, this dream was, was not a good one. Well, here enters Daniel. Now, we met Daniel back in chapter 1 and chapter 2, and uh, here he is back in chapter 4, and it says in verse 8, at last Daniel came in before me, he who is named Belteshazzar, after the name of my God, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I told him the dream. 
Now, here, here we see Daniel come onto the scene, and what we know about Daniel from, from what we have read already in the book of Daniel is that uh, Daniel had a relationship with King Nebuchadnezzar. Starting in chapter 1, he proved himself by uh, not eating of the king's food and, and his diet being better than the diet that the king had given, given to him. And, and they recognize that there is something about this God that Daniel worships, this, this, this God. And, and Nebuchadnezzar, he, he thought of himself as a god to be worshipped. Um, but, but there was respect. There's, there's this mutual respect because not only did Daniel not cave on his worship of the one true God, but he also did respect King Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, he worked hard to, to places of achievement and, and authority and power there in Babylon. And so, as, as we move on into chapter 2, we see that he became an interpreter of dreams for Nebuchadnezzar. And he's, he's had this long career as, as, as someone that was in, in authority there in Babylon. And now here in chapter 4, we see that, that here he is again interpreting dreams for Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, he's, he, he's already aware Daniel worships another god, but yet there's respect and, and even in chapter 3, we see that, that Nebuchadnezzar with Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he saw God, this, this God of Daniel, deliver these men from a fiery furnace. And we think that Nebuchadnezzar is, is going to turn and he's professing to have this, like, you know, this respect for the one true God. But I'll tell you, he doesn't go beyond that, though. We think, man, we're, we're going to you know, Nebuchadnezzar is going to be converted. He's going to express faith. He's going to lay down his pride. He's going to repent of his sins. And yet he still doesn't. And that, that's often a place that may, be, that may be a place that you're at in your faith as well. You're like, I, I you know, I appreciate the Bible. I, you know, I like Jesus. I believe that he did good things. You know, I, I really respect a lot of the teachings of the Bible and the morality and stuff. But, but I, I, I'm just not ready to give him my life and to just fully just follow Jesus as not just my Savior, but, but as my Lord. And, and can I tell you, if, if that's the place that you're at, you're not yet a Christian because Christian is, is, means little Christ. It means that not only has Jesus saved you, that you've repented of your sins, but you've laid your life down to give him lordship of your life. And so this, this is a place where Nebuchadnezzar was at a, at a crossroads, and he'd not crossed that line of faith to say, Jesus, or God, at that point, you're Lord of my life. I lay down my authority for your own, yours. And um, can I just encourage you, too, if, if there's people around you that maybe you're working on, you're witnessing to, and you're hoping would cross the line of faith, don't give, don't, don't give up on them either. Because uh, like Nebuchadnezzar, there's a journey that God is taking some people on that, uh, that bring them to this place of true faith. Um, even, even there's some of you that grew up in the church that you're like, I, I'm questioning whether or not I believe all these things anymore. Can I tell you, doubt can be a healthy thing. People talk about, about deconstructing. Well, what I would like to encourage you is to maybe reconstruct your faith, okay? And do it on the foundation of Jesus Christ, not on the traditions that you were raised with. It's a healthy thing. It's a good thing. Um, and it can bring in a lot of questions that you may have. Don't be afraid of those questions. Don't be afraid of that. As we get to Nebuchadnezzar, what we see is that he proceeds to tell Daniel this dream. I'll summarize basically what this dream was about. He uh, saw a tree, and this tree grew to be tall and strong. And its, its branches went out, and it, it provided shade for all the animals, shelter and food for those, those around. But suddenly what happened is that he saw a holy one come down, and with a command, this, this holy one commanded, chop down that tree, lop off its branches, let the animals scatter, but leave the stump. Leave the stump in its place. In verse 17, if you pick up with me there, it says, and this is part of the meaning that he got in the dream, it says, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets it 
over, sets over it the lowliest of men. The dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw, and you, O Belteshazzar, tell me the interpretation. Because all the wise men of the kingdom are not able to make it known to me, make, make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in you. You see that recognition there. He knew this about Daniel. Verse 19, then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while, and his thoughts alarmed him. The king answered and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. So think about this. Nebuchadnezzar, like, like, a, like a politician, like a, like a president is communicating, I trust you. Even though I'm in this position of high authority, I trust that you're going to tell me what I need to hear when I need to hear it, and you're not afraid of the position that I'm in. Because all these other people, my magicians and my enchanters and my astrologers and the Chaldeans, they're afraid they're going to make me upset by, by telling me what I need to hear. And Daniel, I trust that you respect me, you care about me, and you'll tell me the truth. Don't we like people in our life that are like that? People that genuinely care about you that are not afraid to tell you the truth? That's the kind of relationship that Daniel had with Nebuchadnezzar. He said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of this. So with this affirmation, Daniel goes on to tell Nebuchadnezzar the interpretation of the dream, the hard truth. Verse 22, he says, it is you, O king, who have grown up and become strong, like this tree. This huge tree has grown up, become strong, spread out, provided food and shelter and prosperity to everyone. Your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens and your dominion to the ends of the earth. That's who you are, king. And he interprets the dream in verse 25. Here's what it means when this watcher commanded that the tree be lopped chopped down and branches lopped off, you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Now, that was the bad news. Here's the good news. As it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. So Daniel, he, he interprets the dream. And again, this is not good news for King Nebuchadnezzar. He said, said this is what's going to happen. You're going to be driven from among men. You're basically be, going to become like an animal. You're going to scrounge around. You're going to eat grass. I mean, you're going to be wet with dew. I mean, this is like, oh, he's going to become a crazy man. And this actually was going to happen. This was not good news. But the good news was that he was telling the king until you know that heaven rules, you're going to be like this. But this isn't going to take your life away. This isn't going to take away your legacy if you submit to the lordship of my God and know that he rules in the kingdom of men. That's the reason for this because, Nebuchadnezzar, you've, been, you've, been, you've become so prideful in who you are and all that you've accomplished that God is bringing you to this place where you submit under his lordship and so that's the interpretation of the dream. He could have stopped there. Think about that. He could have stopped. He could have just delivered that bad news and said, this is what, this is what it means. But he had the courage to speak on something else. He had the courage to speak. He dared to speak something that could literally risk his life. Here's what he said, verse 27. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed. 
that there may be perhaps a lengthening of your prosperity. In essence, what Daniel is saying is, I care about you. I want the best for you. You already know that. And so because of that, here's what I, I'm daring to speak to you, how you can be saved through this. Repent of your sins. Turn to the Lord. Um, stop sinning. Practice, practice um, showing mercy instead of being, being so, you know, uptight and, 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 you know, being so wicked and cruel to those that are under your authority. Now, show mercy to the oppressed. Stop sinning, repent, turn to God. Maybe, maybe he'll relent. And that, that's essentially the message of a lot of the prophets in Scripture as well, is, is that God is a God who is holy and there's judgment that's coming. And this, this is a message for us as well, that, that our God is the only God. And you are not God. He is holy. You are not. You've sinned. You've fallen short of Him. And because of His justice and His wrath, God punishes sin. That's, that's who our God is. And Daniel's saying, God punishes sin. But, but man, it doesn't have to stay like that. Repent of your sins. Because what Scripture promises is that He's faithful. He's just. Forgive and cleanse you of your unrighteousness. And the same God that, that Daniel worshiped is the same God that we worship today. And, and thankfully, we have, it, we have a, a fuller revelation in Jesus Christ because we see that God sent his only son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. But here back in, in the Old Testament before Christ, they were looking forward to what, what, what God would do through his son. And that's essentially what Daniel was saying is repent of your sins. Turn to God. Now, if we talk about what Daniel did here a second, I, I want you to also know that as a follower of Jesus, this is something that you are also supposed to do as well. Essentially sharing the gospel. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, and this is in the New Living Translation, I, I use this because I, I like the words that it used and um, it says there, dear brothers and sisters, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. So this, this is for us as a community of a church. Um, you, why don't you just leave that scripture up there just for a second? Gently and humbly are the two words that I just want you to key in on here, okay? What's the opposite of that? Maybe arrogantly and harshly. And isn't that often what has turned us off to people confronting us with our sin? What I want you to see today is a principle that I, I believe we can learn from Daniel in, in how to love people well spiritually. And it's this, if you're taking notes, it's that we are to build bridges of grace that can bear the weight of truth. Bear bridges of grace that can bear the weight of truth. Two questions that people are always asking of you is, do you love me? Do you care about me? Do you love me? Do you care about me? Maybe even, do you want the best for me? Are you going to be there for me? Are you going to walk with me? Or are you just, just saying this to make yourself look better? Are you just saying this because, you know, you're just do, giving lip service to what you believe, but don't, don't follow it? Are you saying this because you think that you're better than me? Daniel dared to speak the truth, but not before he had built that bridge of grace. Not before he had built that bridge of grace. There was respect, there was trust, there was genuine care, genuine love, and Nebuchadnezzar actually asked for it, which is even better. But one of the reasons why I, I believe that Christians can come across as judgmental is because there has been no bridge of grace that can bear that weight of truth. And that often takes time. It takes a long-term relationship with someone question that you need to ask before you confront someone about their sin is, have I built a bridge of grace that can bear the weight of the truth of God? 
And I, I will tell you even from personal experience that, that I'm so thankful for the relationships that I have um, as a pastor and the people that God has placed around me, namely my wife and, and members of our church, um, family and, and close friends, people that have known me and love me, and I know care for me deeply enough to confront me and tell me what I need to hear when I need to hear it. Now, you have friends that are like that as well, and you know a true friend when they'll do that for you, okay? What I also want want to encourage you is this, okay? When it comes to confronting people and sharing things with them, you know, pointing them to Jesus, correcting their actions, is I want you to consider the source as well, okay? How many of us have, have had people confront us about something that's just like either they're really opinionated or um, maybe they just want their own way? They're trying to control us in some way, trying to manipulate us. Maybe they're just critical or mean-spirited or they're just trying to stir up conflict and you know that of them. Can I just encourage you when it comes to those kind of people, you don't have to listen to them. Sometimes, sometimes that comes from a place of pain themselves. And, and if, if it does, my encouragement is eat the meat, spit out the bones. Sometimes it's going to be 99% bones, okay? And sometimes there's a little, little that you can learn from them. Okay, don't just completely write them off because sometimes they have some good things to say. But man, just be careful about who you receive criticism from. If there is someone that has a relationship of love and concern and is there, there long-term for you, man, and they share something to, of concern for you, listen up. Listen up. Listen to them. God may have you be that for someone else, and God may have someone else be that for you. And that's what we as a church are there for. So again, build bridges of grace that can bear the weight of truth. As Galatians 6.1 says, brothers and sisters, if a believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. Now, this is obviously talking about our relationships with other Christians, but let's talk about how do, we, how do we do that in our relationships with people that don't profess to follow Jesus? I'll tell you, one of the biggest lies that I believe has gone around the church and is sometimes a narrative that people use when they, uh, you know, either become disgruntled with a church or, you know, ha- had a bad experience with church is that um, they will say, man, I just want to come to a church that doesn't judge. I, I just want to come to a judgment-free zone, or, or, or we say as a church, I, we don't judge people here, or this is, this is a judgment-free zone here, okay? And I'll tell you, I, I think the heart behind that is genuine, but I'll tell you that it's not scriptural either, because um, honestly, while God is the judge, and we are not to be judgmental, God does call us to make judgments all the time, not just of believers, but of our world and what is right and wrong. And what do we hold in our hands? We have God's Word, the absolute truth, and by it we make a judgment. And when it is out of line with the revealed truth of Scripture, we make a judgment that it is a lie, that is false, that something to be, be spoken out against And so even topics like we talked about last week, the reason why we talk about them is because of the revealed truth of God's Word. And we believe His way is best, and we want to follow it, we want to obey it. And man, if it it hurts somebody else's feelings, fine, but hopefully we do it in a way that's humble and gentle. And hopefully you have a relationship with someone. I'll tell you, that, that that's even something as, as a pastor that when, when we're talking about build, building bridges of grace that can bear the weight of truth, I will preach on topics like that. But man, I'm not going to go around through our whole community. I'm not going to knock on people's doors that have, say, a pride flag on their, on, their, on their doorstep and knock on their door and say, hey, 
this is against the word of God. You're living in sin. You know, I'm not going to knock on someone's, someone's door who's a drug addict and say, hey, you know, turn your life over to Jesus. Give this up, you know. I'm not going to do that because there's no relationship there. I mean, when there's relationship built and you see that someone, prof- you know, is professing to follow Jesus, or you see someone living in sin, you can, you can lovingly and humbly and gently point them to the way of Christ, to his better way. But man, if you do it without a relationship, man, that, that's what's going to lead to someone feeling like, oh, you're just judging me. The other, the other way is, man, when, when you're pointing out things that you're, you're actually a hypocrite on yourself. You've got to take that log out of your own eye before you take the speck out of your brother's eye. That's the concept so, that we've, we've been taught in Scripture. So should we judge sin? Yes. God's Word says we are to judge sin. And essentially, that's what the message of the gospel is in a nutshell, is that, yes, God is holy. He is full of wrath against sin. He is coming to judge. He is one day going to return, and He's going to judge the living and the dead. And all of us, we deserve that judgment. But praise God, for God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. Put your faith in Jesus. Submit to His Lordship. Repent of your sins. Follow Him. And man, live a life for His kingdom. Put, your, put yourself under His authority, man. The message of the gospel is a message of judgment. Because if you don't do that, what, what you are doing is you are going what we call the, the broad way that leads to, to hell. And you're, you're choosing that yourself. And here, here's the concept. If, if you choose and you say, man, God, I don't want, I want to have anything to do with your way and your kingdom. I don't want to follow your way. What God does in eternity is he, he just extends that, that choice for you. He's not going to force anyone into heaven. He's not going to force anyone to bow their knee to worship him, okay? What, what, he, what he will do is he will extend your choice and say, if that's what you want, you can have that in all of eternity. But if you want to submit your life to a good God and believe that his way is best, put yourself under his lordship, then in all of eternity, he will be your savior and your Lord forever. That's the concept of the gospel. And you have to make a decision to follow him, a savior and his Lord. Can I tell you, there are people that will try and shame you for speaking God's truth. Don't be ashamed. Romans 1 verse 16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew and to the Greek. It's our responsibility because we know the truth to communicate to our world who is believing lies, that God loves you. God loves you so much he gave up his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so to do that, we need to build bridges of grace that can bear the weight of truth, dare to speak. In the end, what we see as we, as we end this chapter, starting in verse 34, is that uh, judgment did come to Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, what we see after that judgment happens is exactly as Daniel portrayed, he did become like an animal. And, uh, and he, he went through these periods of time where, where he, he, he lived basically like a crazy man. But he submitted himself to God. And what he, what he did at the end of this chapter is we see that he begins to praise God. Verse 34 it says, After this time had passed... I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven, my sanity returned, and I praised and worshiped the Most High and honored the one who lives forever. His rule is everlasting. His kingdom is eternal. All the peoples of the earth are nothing compared to him. He does as he pleases. Among the angels of heaven and among the peoples of the earth, no one can stop him or say to him, What do you mean by doing these things? When my sanity returned to me, so did my honor and my glory and kingdom. 
My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored as the head of my kingdom with even greater honor than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the King of heaven. All his acts are just and true, and he is able to humble the proud. What I want to tell you as we, as we close is this, as surely as judgment came to Nebuchadnezzar, judgment is coming for each one of us. One day we will stand before the Lord and give an account for what we've done in this life. And either we will try and uh, self-justify ourselves and try and tell God how good of a person we were. But man, what I want you to know is this, what Scripture says, that we've all sinned, we've all fail, failed, we've all fallen short. And my only hope at that judgment seat is to claim Jesus and to claim his righteousness, claim his goodness. And so I want to just give you an opportunity as we close, like Nebuchadnezzar repented of his sins and, and, and just, just proclaimed, heaven rules, God rules in, in the kingdom of men over my life. I want to give you that opportunity as we close. Let's just bow our heads Close your eyes if you'd like to, to just express that, and maybe this is the first time that you've understood what salvation is, repenting of your sins, placing your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord, and you want to do that today, why don't you just raise up your hand, let me know, I'd like to, like to pray with you and for you and lead you, lead you to trust in Jesus right now as your Savior and your Lord. If you'd like to pray, just raise up your hand, I want to lead you right now, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you that even though I, like Nebuchadnezzar, was trying to rule my own life, that you, Lord Jesus, love me enough to die for me, to take away the just penalty that I deserve for my sin. Lord, I give up lordship of my life, and I put my faith in you. Lord, help me to follow you. I give my life to you, and I receive your grace today. Thank you for saving me from the wrath of God, bringing me into your heavenly kingdom, making me your child. My life is not my own. I give it to you. In Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, as we close today, I thank you for each one here at Valley Church. God, would you help us to dare to speak in those situations that are awkward and difficult and hard. God, that we'd follow the prompting of your Holy Spirit. Lord, to build those bridges of grace that can bear the weight of truth. And that our world that is lost, our valley that does not know you, that's medicating, medicating, on alcohol and drugs and sex, fun, prosperity and money, Lord, whatever it is, God, that uh, those idols would fall. And God, that they'd realize that heaven rules, that you, Jesus, are Lord, and that you have authority. God, we pray for the, the conversations this week that we, we might have. We pray for the relationships that we have in our schools, in our workplaces, in our home. God, that people would be drawn to you. God, when, when given the opportunity to speak, we'd be like Daniel, Lord, who dared to speak the truth and share your gospel. Thank you, God, for saving us. And God, that we can live for you. We pray this all in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.